I'd like I'd like to introduce today's speaker, speaker Michael Tyree. Michael received his BS in Forest Science from Penn State in 2003. After finishing his master's and PhD at Virginia Tech in 2008, he accepted the position as a forest ecophysiologist at Louisiana Tech University in 2009. During the last five years, Michael has studied the effects of intensive management and climate change on forest carbon cycling. Right. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have two main goals that we're going to try and, and get for this talk. One is uh, we need to set some groundwork for some later webinars. Uh, and two, the more immediate one is uh, we're going to talk about things that almost everybody, uh, especially if you're out in the woods a lot, has observed, uh, specifically over the last couple of years. Uh, and what we want to try and do is give a little bit of a, uh, a, a biological perspective to what is going on uh, that's causing what you're seeing. <clears throat> so if you, uh, if you don't have or you don't want to uh, ask questions as we go along, or if you come up with something after the fact, or if you're not listening to this uh, webinar live, my contact information is uh, listed right here. Uh, feel free to send me an email at any time, and we can uh, talk trees. So let's start off with a little bit of a question. Uh, this kind of a review for some of you that have attended the uh, the climate change webinars uh, in the past. Those of you that haven't, this will kind of just get everybody uh, on track of where we're going. So uh, climate scientists predict what by the end of this century? A, that temperatures will increase, precipitation will decrease, both temperature will increase and precip decrease, or no change at all. All right, so we had, uh, this is actually perfect. So for this one, there are two correct answers, and it just depends on where you're located. So those of you that are located further in the east, uh, A will actually be more, uh, more true for you. Uh, it would just be a temperature increase. Those of you that are located, especially in the western Gulf states, uh, the probability of C uh, is more true. You'll see both an increase in temperature and a decrease in precipitation. So let's just take a look at that uh, a little bit closer. So this is a uh, figure taken out of the IPCC uh, report, and it's showing uh, global temperatures over the next 10 years and then uh, by the end of this century. And what we're finding is that within uh, the range of Loblolly Pine, so it's, it's got a fairly large range all the way from the Atlantic over to the uh, western Gulf states, uh, you're looking at anywhere between a 2 and 6 degrees Celsius increase. Now what this means, uh, this is kind of broad, this is just an annual increase, but let's look at it uh, from, a, from a, another perspective. This is the number of summertime days or the number of days uh, in a year that the temperature will be expected or predicted to go above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you listen to tomorrow's uh, webinar by uh, Dr. Tim Martin, uh, he'll, he's going to talk about some of the direct effects of this increased temperature. So, uh, but what this is showing is that if you use a baseline, about 20-year baseline uh, from 1960 to 1980, uh, you can see, depending on where you're located, uh, what the number of degrees above 90 is. And by the end of the century, that's predicted to go up quite substantially, regardless of where you're located within the range of Bob Wally Pine. So if you're further in the east, you may be at 150, maybe even pushing 165 days above 90 degrees. If you're further in the west, you may be somewhere around the uh, 150 mark. So. A lot of this heat is going to come during the growing season, and it's going to start to provide uh, pretty substantial stress for some of our plants, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. In terms of precipitation, uh, what we want to focus on is this lower graph, and this again is, is looking at global precip, uh, but 
you know, we're really talking specifically about the uh, southeastern United States all the way over to uh, East Texas. And you can see anything in white uh, just means that it's not clear what's going to happen. Maybe you get more, maybe you get lower uh, precip. Uh, the models just don't agree, so they, they come out as unclear. Those of you that are located, though, in the western Gulf states, so this would be Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, certainly Texas, it's predicted that you'll see somewhere between a 5 and 10 percent decrease in precipitation. Now that's during the June to August time period, our, our main growing season. So depending on where you're at, you may have these uh, compounding problems of high temperature as well as decreased precip. And this little figure here does a good job of summarizing what the problem is that we're dealing with. If you have warmer temperatures or you have drier, uh, lower precip, um, you may move up into this upper right direction where you could start to see uh, some mortality. You move over this mortality threshold, these plants are under greater stress, and the chance of something going wrong is greater. Even if precip doesn't change on an annual basis or even a growing season basis, over most of this range it's predicted that we're going to see more extreme events. Uh, so this would be longer duration droughts, maybe more intense droughts. Uh, so even if you get the same amount of rain on average, that doesn't mean that it's equally distributed throughout the growing season. It may come all in five big storms. So how it gets given uh, is, is very important for plant stress as well. So this kind of sets the stage, or at least the problem, uh, for what we're talking about. So here's an outline of where we're going to go. Uh, we're going to focus on giving a definition for productivity as well as an overview of plant water relations. Uh, for some of you, this may be a repeat. Uh, for some of you, just a really good refresher to kind of get you, get you thinking again on, on what climate stress is going to do. And then we're going to specifically talk about drought stress and what the plant responses to that are. The main goal of this webinar is not uh, to necessarily go into the management of water stress. That's going to be talked about much more by uh, Dr. Martin uh, in tomorrow's webinar. But we are going to just kind of lightly introduce you to some individual as well as stand level uh, management that you can do uh, to kind of help hedge your bet the best you can. So let's start with productivity. And, and the way that we use this or define it, it's going to start with the needles. So you have a tree. If you take a close-up of those needles and you take one single needle out of there, you can see that you have multiple needles per fascicle. And in this right image, you can see what that looks like in cross-section. And on the outside edges and the inside edges of these needles, you have these little openings. So a needle is an extremely well-protected uh, little portion of the plant that prevents moisture from, from being lost from the leaves. So in order to actually have any change in gas or moisture, that's going to take place in these little pores uh, that we call stomata. And we're going to talk about these over and over again because they're a huge part of uh, plant water relations. So this is the site where carbon comes into the plant and at the same time, and it's uh, unfortunate for the plant, but it has no other way of working around this, when it opens up those stomates to let CO2 in, which is required for photosynthesis, at the same time you have water being lost from the plant. And plants have managed to do some wonderful things with this water loss. We call it transpiration. Uh, they're able to move minerals around. They're able to get water to move throughout the plant. Uh, so they're able to capitalize on, on some of this required loss. And you can see in this image, this is what uh, the stomates look like on the underside of the needles. They go into rows. And they're going to open and close. And the plant will be able to control uh, the rate at which water gets lost and the rate at which CO2 comes in. But always remember in the back of your mind, we have this problem. If CO2 is coming in, that means water is going out. And these things can be measured quite simply in the field. Uh, you can use infrared gas analyzers, and you can measure uh, individual needles or pairs of needles. And you can figure out exactly what 
the photosynthetic rate or the transpiration rate is of these, of these needles at any time. So that's looking at the leaf level. So of course, the canopy of a tree is made up of many of these. Uh, so when you take the entire canopy together and you look at all of the CO2 that's coming in, we call that gross primary productivity. And that's the most that comes in. But you don't only have CO2 coming in. Uh, photosynthesis only takes place under light. So at nighttime, you're not fixing CO2. Uh, and you have plenty of ways that CO2 gets lost at the entire plant level. So every cell of a plant has to respire. You take this sugar that's fixed through CO2 and you chop it up and it gets used for energy. That energy is used to either create new tissue or maintenance the tissue that's there. So needles are going to be respiring. You're going to have stems that are respiring and the roots are respiring. You're going to be losing a little bit of carbon as dissolved organic carbon out of the roots as exudates, um, as well as some volatiles that will come off of the foliage. So there's lots of sources of carbon loss. And these can each be measured. Uh, there's different chambers for measuring CO2 loss out of these different tissues. After you account for the carbon that leaves the plant, we now have a new term for it, and we call that net primary productivity. The same as when you do your taxes. You have gross income. After you take out the money that goes in the outward direction, you're left with that net income. And carbon is very much uh, analogous to income. It's the income for uh, plants. So that's really only a portion of the story. Uh, once you have carbon in and carbon out, what stays in the plant has to be allocated. And what a lot of people uh, don't really think of is what our goals are as silviculturalists or forest managers is very different than what the plant's goal is. Uh, so if you look at this little uh, figure on the right, you can see that the one is the first priority for plants. That's new foliage, new buds, new root tips if needed. Number two uh, is going to be the roots. Number three, this is the third priority for the plant, that's going to be storage of carbohydrates either in the roots or in the terminal buds or in the foliage or in the main stem. And then the fourth and the last priority for the plant is actually diameter growth, uh, which is completely reverse of how we prioritize carbon. We want diameter growth first. That's how we make our money. Uh, we care a little less about the other things. They're really just support. But by understanding uh, how plants prioritize, it kind of answers the question of why we see a loss in diameter growth way before we can sense any other stress to the plant. It's really the first thing uh, that plants are going to, to show as a sign of stress. Some other things to take a look at is uh, protective chemicals. That's going to be uh, a use of carbon. So if the plant is stressed or it's attacked by insects, more of that carbon is going to have to go into protective chemicals uh, to help kind of save the plant. So that means less for diameter growth. So we want to keep in mind, not only is it the amount of carbon coming in and that being lost to respiration, but it's also where the plant decides to put that carbon. So this is really the premise uh, that we are starting from. So we're going to move into uh, a little discussion about plant water relations. Uh, this is specific to pines, since this is a pine map webinar. Uh, every example that we're using is with loblolly pine. Um, <clears throat> so let's start off with a little question. This is question number two. How does water move through a plant? A, it's pumped by the roots. B, suction generated by the foliage. C, water does not move through plants. D, it's absorbed directly through the foliage. Okay, 
Looks like uh, the vast majority got it right. So it is a suction, a negative force or a negative pressure or tension uh, that is generated by water leaving the leaf and going into the atmosphere. And that negative pressure is transmitted all the way down the tree, out into the roots, out into the soil. Those of you that answered A, um, there are few occasions where positive pressure actually gets built up in the roots. Some good examples would be uh, sap flow uh, for, say, maple trees uh, in the early spring or winter time. Um, and there's a, there's a couple where you'll actually build up positive pressure, but, but rarely does that, does that happen. And it's for usually other reasons. It's not really pumping water out of the roots. Uh, and then those of you that answered D, there are some rare examples of plants that are able to absorb a substantial amount of moisture directly through the foliage. Those are mostly extremely tall trees in the western United States, like redwood, uh, that kind of grow in that fog belt where some foliar interception uh, actually turns out to be a very significant source. But for pines, uh, especially loblolly pine, suction generated through the foliage is, is the dominant way that water moves. I've got a question here from Jim F. He asked, um, is sure. reduced diameter growth the first indicator of moisture stress? And does that hold for hardwoods too, i.e. sugar maple? Uh, it is not the first sign. There's other ways that you can see it, but usually the first thing that, that we will pick up on if you're not out there measuring photosynthesis or something with, with equipment uh, will be a, a kind of tight growth rings when you look at how the growth rate of these trees were. You'll see actual drought years in the growth rings. So that's usually the first way that you pick it up uh, with pines. Uh, with hardwoods, that's also not the case because those leaves will wilt. Um, so you don't see wilting, though, in pines. So uh, for most people, you'll first sense uh, just through a reduction in diameter growth. OK, so let's talk a little bit about how the water moves through. We uh, use a, a model called the SPAC model. It stands for Soil Plant Atmosphere Continuum. And really, uh, what it means is that there is a continuous line of water all the way from the surface of the leaf down through the stem of the tree, out into the roots, and out into the soil. And we have this, this concept, we call it water potential. And, and for our purposes, we don't particularly care. Um, we don't need to define it or know exactly what it is. What we need to know about water potential is that it's a gradient. And water, it's a law. It has to do this every time. It can't, come, can't not do it. Water must always move in the direction of high water potential to low water potential. And in terms of water, uh, movement through a plant, we're almost always talking about tension. So these are negative numbers. So you're moving from a less negative number to a more negative number. So if you remember that it has to move along that gradient, that will uh, really help ha us understand why water is able to move from the soil into the root, into the stem, up into the leaf, and out into the atmosphere. So let's, uh, let's look at each of these. We've got three main regions that we'll talk about, and let's look at each of them uh, separately. So those of you that were uh, part of the soils webinar, I suspect that you would have uh, talked a little bit about soil water. This is where most of uh, the water that the plant is going to use is going to be obtained from. So it's going to be uh, heavily dependent on what the texture of that soil is, how much water is in there to begin with, what is the depth of the, of the rooting zone. Uh, so this is really where everything's going to start. In order for water to come into the plant, it has to have a lower water potential than what the soil has. So if we want to look at our uh, first graph, let's say that the soil wa water potential is almost, uh, almost saturated, so it's just about zero. In order for that water to move into the root, that root's water potential needs to be something less than zero, so negative 0.2. And it doesn't have to be a lot, just enough for water to kind of move 
uh, via diffusion into the root. And most of it's going to come through a root hair, and water is going to move through a number of different routes, and its eventual location is going to be to the center of that root. We call that the steel, and that's where all of our transport tissues uh, are located. That's going to move the water up the tree. The next phase uh, is bulk flow of water. So we now have dumped water into the xylem. The xylem is the conductive tissue that's going to take water and nutrients up the tree. And you can think of xylem as uh, a bunch of straws that are kind of put together. Now, you can't put these straws, at least when you're dealing with tracheids in, in pines, these straws don't go end to end real nice. They have to kind of get fit to the side. There's little holes or pits in them, and water moves up as far as it can in one tracheid. Then it has to go through a pit into the next one, and then up again. But it's a continuous stream of water. And this water is under tension because it has to be more negative than what the water potential in the root is. If it's not, water will not go up the tree. So we use a theory, uh, it's called the cohesion tension theory, and this is where water molecules not only stick to each other, but they also stick to the side of the xylem. And it uses that uh, cohesion and adhesion forces to allow that water column to move up the plant. Once the water moves up through the xylem, uh, it moves out the branch, and then it moves into the leaf. And eventually, uh, that conductive tissue will kind of leave that water off in the inner space that's inside of the stomata. And that water will then leave the stomate and evaporate off the leaf surface into the atmosphere, or off of the surface of uh, the internal structure of that leaf. And there's a little bit of a phase shift that takes place. Uh, so the water potential gradient's not as great as it looks. But if we look at this whole process, uh, we can see that you can get extremely negative water potentials generated uh, as the water leaves the leaf into the atmosphere. That's a huge driving force. And it's really the reason why a water molecule is able to move from the soil into the root up the stem out the branch, into the leaf, and then out into the atmosphere. It's an extremely uh, important driving force. And so long as those stomates are open and they're able to have a lower water potential at the top of the tree than it has at the bottom of the tree, water is going to move. And it's going to do it in, in the correct fashion. So this is uh, really under ideal conditions. And what we're going to talk about next is this is rarely ideal and how do plants overcome this. So before we do that, let's, uh, let's just kind of look at, you know, we're, we're, we were talking about xylem moving out of an individual needle. Well, let's look at all the needles in the canopy as a collective, as a collective whole. So let's take a young tree. It's about 15, 16 feet in height. Uh, how much water? on a good summer day, so this is kind of an average summer day, no water stress, do you think uh, a tree this size will use? And that's question three. Uh, so how much water does a young loblolly pine use in a single day? Half a gallon of water. B, two gallons of water. C, five gallons of water. D, 10 or more gallons of water. OK, so it looks like we had a, uh, an even split between C and D. The correct answer is greater than 10 gallons of water. In fact, uh, a tree, an average tree of this height during a summer uh, with water not being limiting uh, has been shown to use about 11 gallons per day. Interestingly, uh, a little bit more recent data 
has shown, now this is a slightly larger loblolly pine. This is a mid-rotational loblolly pine, somewhere around 27 centimeters in diameter. Uh, these are some data that were uh, part of a paper that, that was uh, published by Gonzalez and Martin. And these data were collected in, Brain, in uh, Bainbridge, Georgia. And it shows red being irrigated trees. So these are well-watered trees, blue being uh, control. So they did not receive water. So at some point during the summer, uh, you can see that they would have been limited. And you can see that it kind of maxes out. When water is provided during the summer days, it maxes out at about 10 gallons per day. So for loblolly pine, it's a pretty good rate uh, of water movement. And to just put that in perspective, uh, if you have a planting density of, say, somewhere around 725 trees per acre, and each of those trees is losing about 10 gallons a day, that's 8,000 gallons per acre per day that can be lost uh, from that site. So transpiration is a huge, huge uh, source of water loss. In fact, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, uh, trees will be removed from wet areas uh, because it, if you want, so if you have a, an aquifer or, or some sort of water body that you don't want water to leave, oftentimes those trees will be removed around it because they act as biological pumps and they can just pump tremendous amount of water out in a given year. So let's just look at some fully grown. This is just to give you a little bit of perspective. Uh, so this is a full grown 82 foot uh, Monterey pine. These are located in the western United States. This is Pinus radiata. It's, it's largely planted throughout the world, uh, probably the most common pine worldwide, certainly not in the US, but worldwide. Uh, and a tree at full size uh, was shown to use up about 92 gallons per day. So that's an individual full grown tree. And to even look at the larger end of that scale, uh, let's look at Douglas fir. And this is an extremely large tree. They rival some of the redwoods in overall height. Uh, this particular one was about 250 feet in height. And that one was shown to use about 140 gallons of water per day per tree. So again, uh, it wouldn't take long for uh, you to deplete the water reserves that are in those soils if they're not being continuously replenished. So that's a little bit of, 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 of what we mean when we talk about plant productivity. Uh, that's just roughly how plant water relations within a uh, loblolly pine is going to work. And this is, again, under ideal conditions. So now let's shift our focus a little bit and let's look at what happens when we have drought stress and let's talk a little bit about how plants uh, respond to that. So we're not going to talk about the direct effects of higher temperature. That's the topic of tomorrow's webinar. Uh, but we are going to talk about the indirect effects of temperature and that is increase in water use. And any of you that have a garden that you plant, uh, when summertime hits, you know you have to add water. So the higher the temperature, the higher the water use is for those plants, the faster you can deplete those reserves. And this is really what's going on. So remember, on those leaves, we have them lined with all of these little pores. You have CO2 moving in, and you have water moving out. And it's that difference in vapor pressure uh, between the inside of the leaf and the atmosphere that really dictates how fast water is going to leave that plant. And you know, we, this concept of CO2 in, carbon in, water out, uh, when you look at those together, we call that water use efficiency. And that's how efficient uh, a plant is at capturing CO2, which it needs to do to grow and, and regenerate tissue, uh, and trying to minimize the amount of water loss. But if we look over here at this figure uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, we can see that uh, each one of these curves is a different relative humidity, but all of them have the same general shape. As you increase temperature, you see an exponential rise in this vapor pressure deficit. 
And that vapor pressure deficit, remember, is what is going to uh, generate or it's going to really control the speed at which water is lost. So if water is just leaving that leaf at a fast rate and that plant is able, hopefully, to sense that this is occurring, and this can be quite harmful to the plant, um, one thing a plant can do is it can start to close those stomata and try and lessen the rate at which water is going to leave the plant. So just a reminder, remember, um, we're working under the premise that we are going to be experiencing longer, more intense dry periods under higher temperatures. Uh, depending on where you're located, maybe precipitation is actually going to be a little bit lower, which is going to compound this problem. So let's look at water stress. And go ahead and, and we'll just kind of define this figure because we're going to use it a couple times. Uh, water stress is going to fall along a continuum. Now, I apologize, this y-axis, uh, this should be just water potential, not soil water potential, but it's in megapascals. The solid line at the top is what the soil water potential is. The dotted line in the middle is what the root water potential is. Remember we said that for water to move from the soil into the plant, it has to decrease that water potential in the root. And it also has to decrease that water potential up the tree and then in the leaf. If it can't do that, water won't move in that direction. Remember, it's that law that water has to follow. Another thing that we, you want to be aware of is this is not a linear uh, axis. So we have point, negative 0.5 megapascals to 1 to 1 1.5, and then we have negative 3 megapascals. Uh, those of you that are familiar with soil water potential, you may remember uh, that negative 1.5 megapascals, that's what we call the permanent wilting point. So at least for plants like sunflower, which is what this was developed on, uh, this is the point at which when the soil dries, the plant is not able to recover. So we call that pretty extreme drought. We consider negative 1 to be fairly moderate drought. But you can see, even at a soil water potential of negative 1.5, that means that the root is even lower than that, and presumably the foliage is even lower than that. When you get to negative 3, uh, the top of that tree is, is pretty dry. So with that, let's talk a little bit about what are some signs. So Unfortunately, when you're dealing with pines, you can't just easily look at the tree and tell that it's stressed. So unlike a lot of uh, our broadleaf plants, pines don't wilt. Uh, so we won't know from that. The first sign that you're going to see, and this is under fairly mild stress, uh, is a decrease in stomatal conductance. So that stomatal pore will go from an open position to a closed position. This refers to that earlier question of, is can you tell looking at this? The only way that you're going to tell by looking at uh, the stomate is by putting an instrument on there that's measuring uh, transpiration or carbon uh, uptake from, from the atmosphere. So for most people, no. You're not going to be able to sense this. But the plant is doing this fairly early on. Now, one thing that this does, and this actually causes a little bit of a problem, and here's a, a really neat, uh, neat example. Uh, when you close a stomate, water leaving a leaf has, has lots of, of benefits. Um, even though it's, it's overall kind of a negative thing for a plant, it's found ways to use it to its, to its benefit where it can. Uh, one thing that it does is it helps keep those leaves uh, cooler. So the same as when sweat uh, evaporates off of our skin, it helps cool our bodies. Plants do the same thing where it, it will evaporate water off of the leaf surface through transpiration, and it will help keep that leaf cool. And this is an aerial image. This was taken uh, using a unmanned drone, and it was flown over a peach orchard. And there was a natural gradient on that orchard where we had very dry soils on this corner, and then down on this corner, uh, we had a little bit more soil moisture. And what we are able to tell is that the leaf temperature, so these are each one of these is an individual peach tree. Uh, you can see that the crown leaf temperature 
goes up where water becomes stressful, and that's because those stomates are closing, that's less water leaving the plant, and you can actually pick that up in a thermal image, uh, just doing a simple flyover uh, using some, uh, some different types of uh, lenses on your camera. So that's one of the other benefits, and, and this kind of creates another problem that, that will be talked about a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, those leads are up there. Those things are intercepting the sun's radiation. If they get hot and those stomates are closed, they have no way of avoiding that sunlight, uh, and they've got to do something to cool those leaves because they can get extremely hot up there in the top of those trees. All right, so the next thing that a plant is going to uh, see, another sign, uh, is going to be a, a decrease in growth, uh, specifically diameter growth but also a decrease in elongation of needles and, and stem elongation and things like that. So if you were to cut a cookie out of a tree or you were to take an increment borer and pull a core out of a tree, you can, you can look at those annual growth rings. And you can very easily, on an older tree, pick out which of those years uh, that plant was stressed. And that stress could come from a variety of reasons, but more often than not, that stress uh, comes about because of a decrease in water during the summer months or the growing season. So where those growth rings are real tight together, those would be drought years uh, for this. This is kind of a made-up example of, of a uh, cross-section of a stem. And you can see that diameter growth, even though you may not have sensed anything else in the tree because these weren't especially difficult dry years, you didn't get mortality or anything like that, uh, because of the way that carbon is allocated, you're going to see a decrease in diameter growth very, very early. So this slowdown in growth uh, also occurs because it requires water uh, water has to get moved into cells in order for them to expand. So the same as you would put water into a water balloon and it makes the rubber expand. Uh, that's how cells grow. So if you don't have enough water to do that, expansion gets decreased. That means you may have less flushes per year of needles, decrease in diameter growth. Um, and all of this really is just remembering where, where does a tree put its resources first. Uh, another effect is a reallocation of resources. And this has been shown numerous times, uh, especially in younger plants, so greenhouse experiments and pot experiments. Uh, these things have been worked out really well. Maybe not necessarily in full-grown trees uh, to the same extent, but uh, generally speaking, especially for younger trees, you'll see a change in the root-to-shoot ratio. So if you're stressed, it makes sense that a plant would put more resources into root growth. That's where water is going to be intercepted. Uh, maybe decrease in leaf area, since you don't need to lose any more water than you have to. Um, some more recent work actually shows that the expression of, uh, or the, the upregulation of genes will, will increase the expression of some of these water acclimation proteins. Some specifically, and this is still at very mild uh, stress, we're talking negative uh, one megapascal. And some of that is protective proteins. Um, we have water transport proteins. We have different proteins that help with stomatal regulation and osmotic adjustment. So uh, even at a very mild water stress, we start to see at a genetic level uh, some of these changes and some of these genes being upregulated. So we can see those. Uh, on this continuum as well. So we're going to talk now a little bit about increasing stress. So we're starting to come on the verge of what we would say a pretty stressful situation or even uh, starting to approach more intense uh, water stress. One of the first things that we'll see when we start to get over this negative uh, 1.5 megapascal range is a yellowing of old foliage. So those of you, especially uh, in the western portion of the western Gulf states, uh, 2010, 2011 were extremely dry years for us. Uh, and you may have noticed that the needles turned yellow really early in the summertime and actually dropped well before they typically do. So instead of the needles yellowing, say, in September, 
uh, by late July, certainly early August, they were already yellowing up and starting to drop. Uh, it's been shown that under fairly mild conditions, this yellowing of old foliage, uh, there are certain uh, proteins that will cause this. So the expression of some of these senescence genes, uh, even under severe, so the negative 1.5 megapascal range, will actually induce this yellowing of old needles. Another problem, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, uh, is the introduction of air embolisms into the uh, xylem of the plant. So remember, once water makes it into the bottom of the tree, it's going to move up the stem through a series of straws. These are xylem. Uh, in gymnosperms, they're tracheids. Uh, angiosperms have, have other types uh, as well. But we're talking about these uh, fairly thin uh, tracheids that have to butt up against each other, and water has to move uh, up the plant, through a pit, up the plant, through a pit. And remember, it's under tension. So we have increasingly more negative pressures taking place inside the tree. And these water columns have to stay together. You can think of it uh, as cars on a train. As the engine takes off, uh, the next car gets pulled, the next one gets pulled, the next one gets pulled. And, and there's kind of a chain reaction. We call that the water column. And it's moving up the tree. And it starts to get pulled and pulled under more and more tension as the plant undergoes greater and greater water. Hello? Testing? Testing? OK. Now, there you are. We Sorry lost you for a minute. That. So uh, where, where did we cut off at? Was it at uh, embolisms forming? Uh, yes. OK. Uh, I apologize for that. We must have a, uh, a bad connection or a storm rolling in here. But uh, we'll keep moving with it. And so if you have these water columns under extreme negative tension, uh, You'll break that water column, and an air embolism will form. And that will inhibit the flow of water up that tree. So as more and more of these embolisms form, that water is now going to have a much more torturous path. It's going to have to move up. And maybe it's blocked here, and it's got to move over again. And it gets blocked again, and it has to move up. Um, so it creates a real problem uh, for the tree. And what can eventually happen is if enough of these embolisms form, you can actually stop water flow up the tree altogether. OK. So this is a little further down on the continuum, but it still creates a problem. Uh, Eventually, you're going to have impediments of the xylem, so it's going to impede water flow. And you could starve the top of the plant that way. If these problems persist, uh, eventually, those stomates are closed long enough. There's no water getting up to the top of the tree. Eventually, what can occur is uh, this idea of carbon starvation. And that is, Regardless of whether CO2 is being fixed through photosynthesis, remember it's only going to take place during good times of the year when water is plentiful, uh, during the daylight hours. Uh, no matter what, water or CO2 is always being lost from the plant through respiration. Even at night, all of these cells have to respire. So if you are losing carbon continuously, and you're not taking it in, eventually you're going to deplete it. And you could end up killing the tree just through carbon starvation. Now, this is still a hypothesis. Uh, and there's a little bit of debate among uh, scientists as whether or not uh, or what the actual mechanism for carbon starvation is, um, or whether it's something else that's killing the tree. But in theory, uh, if you have to keep these things closed long enough, you'll end up killing that tree eventually, and you'll start to see mortality. So here's an overview of that schedule of events. We have a uh, 
a couple papers that are put in here. If, you, if you'd like me to send you these uh, references, I'll be more than happy to. You can grab my email uh, off the first slide. Um, <clears throat> but this is what will happen if, if this water stress persists. So even if it's not just carbon starvation, uh, a stressed plant is more susceptible to a number of different agents. It may be insect attack. It may be fire. Um, whatever it is, there's these other agents that will attack these stressed trees. And here's a photo of a uh, southern pine beetle outbreak. And this leads us to our next question. This is question four. How do insects find drought-stressed trees? A, uh, a heat signature is generated from non-transpiring leaves. B, uh, the cavitation or the air embolisms forming in the xylem make a noise that they can hear. C, uh, there are stress chemicals that are released by the foliage. Or D, all of the above. Okay, looks like we've got C and D. The actual answer is all of the above, but C is by far the most important uh, of these. Uh, so insects, different insects, uh, southern pine beetles just one, but you may have uh, uh, ips or, or, or whatever the insect is that attacks stressed trees. Um, Needles that are not transpiring are going to be warmer. We saw that in the example of the aerial photo taken on that peach plantation. Uh, and that may show up, and different insects will have different abilities uh, in order to sense that temperature of the leaf. There's also some increasing evidence that when those water columns break, it makes an acoustical noise that insects are able to tap into. and we can hear it uh, if you take a stethoscope and you put it up to a to the stem of a tree uh, during an extreme dry portion of the year. You can hear those water columns actually breaking inside the tree. Uh, the most widely accepted and there's a, the most data showing this is that there are stress chemicals that are released not only by the stressed tree but also by insects that uh, have found that tree. Uh, these different pheromones and, and different uh, phenolics that are released into the air can be sensed by passing insects, and they're able to hone in on the stressed trees. It makes sense for insects to attack these stressed trees because a healthy tree has a much better way of defending off attack, either through sap flow uh, or different phenolic compounds that get released. So if you can find the stressed tree, those insects have a much better time of being able to attack it successfully and get what they want from it. Not only do you have insects attacking trees, but oftentimes after uh, that tree dies, you end up having some other problems such as fire. So you get some of these synergistic uh, effects that occur. And this is an example uh, that took place uh, in uh, just outside of Natchitoches, uh, Louisiana. And back in the mid 80s, uh, there was a southern pine beetle outbreak. And it killed somewhere around 4,200 acres of southern pine beetle or of, of trees. And then about three years later, uh, there was a huge fire that rolled through uh, that stand. And it took out the ones that were stressed as well as some healthy trees. And it ended up eating up about 7,200 acres uh, when all was said and done. So even if the water stress itself doesn't kill the plant, it certainly makes the plant much more vulnerable to other agents such as insect and fire to come in and kind of finish that job off. So this is a summary. Uh, this figure was pulled out of an uh, article by Allen and others uh, out of Forest Ecology and Management. And this is globally. Uh, each of these white dots represents a uh, documented 
case of where climate change led to uh, mortality or widespread mortality within the stand, whether it caused insect outbreaks or fires or direct results of drying. Uh, and you can go into this document, you can find specific examples, but you can see that in the United States, most of these problems are occurring in the western US, uh, definitely the southwest. And we can see them moving east as far as uh, the Atlantic coast, up in the northeast, and even in our area of Oklahoma, East Texas, uh, Louisiana, here in the western Gulf states. The expectation is that uh, more and more of these dots will go onto these global maps as we continue to move forward uh, throughout the rest of the century. So that's the the main points that we wanted to cover in this webinar. Uh, the rest of our time we're going to dedicate to just kind of giving you a premise or, or just a, a preview of how we may go about managing for water stress. And we're going to talk about managing at the individual tree level as well as managing at the stand level. And as I mentioned earlier in this uh, webinar, this is going to be talked about much more extensively uh, in tomorrow's webinar by Dr. Tim Martin. Uh, and he'll talk much more about managing uh, in different ways that you can manage, especially at the uh, stand level. So one way is just in seedling selection. So we know that we have western seed sources and we have eastern seed sources and we know that we have growth differences amongst them. Typically, uh, most of our very fast growing uh, seed sources come out of the Atlantic states. And when they get planted in the western range of loblolly pine, they do extremely well until water becomes limiting. Uh, western Gulf states, very dry, hot, uh, late summer droughts are, are fairly common, whereas the eastern uh, portion of the range tends to get fairly, although it gets very hot in the summer, you tend to have a lot more moisture that's distributed throughout the summer months as well. So we know that there's differences in selection of provenances. Uh, we know that western species have decreased transpiration, so these go back to some uh, studies that were done decades ago on seedlings and greenhouse studies. We know that there's differences in root-to-shoot ratios among these seed sources. Uh, we know that the seed sources from the western provenances, uh, specifically the lost pine, not very good growth, very good survival though, uh, they tend to have a lot more fine roots. So we know that there's some sort of structural differences among provenances that, that give these plants the ability to tolerate these drier conditions. So one thing you can do is just selecting uh, different genotypes. Some more recent uh, data shows that not only do we have differences in, in the way these plants grow, among provenances, but we actually have different genotypes or, or kind of these third and fourth generation plants uh, that we have a lot more control over. So we have some genotypes that have been shown to uh, have better control over their stomata. So remember those little pores on the leaves? If you can close them, you can, you can start to limit the amount of water loss, but you can't keep them closed too long or you starve. Uh, so if you have really good control and you can open and close those things just as needed, uh, presumably those plants are going to be more resistant to cavitation uh, as well as more productive under drier conditions. And there's some data uh, that shows that plants are able to do this. And there's some more recent studies uh, that show uh, different stomatal conductances among very specific genotypes. So we're moving in a stage in in loblolly pine seedling development where uh, we have clones that we can actually select very specific genotypes for those site conditions. And we have broad crown uh, idiotypes and we have narrow crown idiotypes and uh, the idea is that less leaf area uh, may give you less water loss, may be more nutrient use efficient. Uh, and if you had a site that you knew was going to be subjected to lots of drought, uh, you may plant some of these narrow crown uh, genotypes on those sites and they may be better able to tolerate that. 
regardless of that, um, one thing that always needs to be considered is that almost across all these genotypes on a very dry year, so if you're in, in East Texas or Louisiana back in 2010 or 11, uh, most of the plantings at the seedling stage uh, were unsuccessful. So if you're going to go the clone route, um, one thing to keep in mind is that you increase your risk, you increase your cost, and if that's an unsuccessful planting, then um, that may be something that needs to be considered. But we're moving in a direction where you can really start to select individual genotypes uh, for that site condition, and that's uh, extremely promising for the future. So not only do we have individual tree selection, but we also have, uh, at the stand level, we can manage much more actively. This means intervening earlier. So uh, maintaining proper stand density through removal of invasives or thinning or competition control is going to help decrease overall stand water loss. So that may allow those soils to keep more of that water longer into the drought. Uh, protection against insect and disease. This means if you see a sick plant, go in there and remove it right away, uh, as well as also keeping fuel loads down or using prescribed burning uh, or competition control uh, to help prevent any of these larger catastrophic fires that could occur. So really the story is, is uh, in order to manage at the stand level, you just have to be much more active and much more early to intervene, uh, and it can be done. So as I said before, uh, this will be talked about much more in tomorrow's webinar. We're about out of time. Uh, but these are just a list of the key points. Um, plants are going to undergo more stress in the future. You tend to find a loss in productivity, at least in diameter growth, long before you see tree mortality. Uh, that's because trees allocate carbon differently. Drought effects are going to fall along a continuum of mild to more severe drought and management can be uh, at the plant and stand level as well. So if there's any questions, uh, I can answer them now. Or if you think of some later on, you can email me and, and we can talk uh, by email later. Thanks, Michael. Let's, let's give a digital round of applause. There's a smiley face icon under your name under participants. And if you just mouse over it, you can select the applause icon. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat box, and we'll read them off. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions. So thank you for everybody for showing up today. Um, please note we have well, a companion. Oh, no. Nope. Question? We, oh, here we go. Now we just need to make sure we push out the survey. So I'm going to go ahead and push the survey out to everybody. You'll see a, uh, you should see a browser window pop up uh, that will try to be to try to load the survey. Sometimes this takes a little while, but you can vi revisit that site at any time. So if you don't get immediate access to the survey, don't worry, don't panic. Uh, you'll have any time you can you can do this any time after the webinar. It's important that you follow that survey for those of you especially who want CEUs because you also will need to finish that survey before you can get to the CEU uh, form. So I'll push that out to everybody right now. And that probably popped up a window, a browser window in front of your webinar window. So you may want to maneuver those windows separately. If for some reason you can't get access to the survey, sometimes it does take a while, I'm going to uh, also put that link directly into the chat box. You can copy that link and, and uh, try to access it uh, sometime later. If you have any problems with any of that, feel free to give me a holler at my email. Uh, it's being typed in here. And I can certainly assist you with getting your CEUs. That's all I have, Sean. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating today.
I hope you come back for the next session tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. Central and 4 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be going over manage management implications and temperature effects. Thanks.